Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and speak to you. I would also like to, uh, initially to congratulate you as a nation and the minister for, for taking this important initiative that we've just uh, learned about. I think that's a very encouraging uh, uh, development. Um, uh, I'm here to, um, to try to convey the experience of thousands of health professionals and, um, and millions of patients in Sweden. Uh, hopefully as encouragement for the work that you are uh, doing currently and planning uh, going forward. Uh, I do this as the chair of a group of experts on quality registries in Sweden. Our task is every year to review the progress reports from these registries and provide feedback to the people who run the registries so that they are able to make the registries ever better uh, as a tool to support uh, clinical management and improvement. I've also taken a great interest in the registries in my research. So most recently I've been uh, studying how the registries are used in clinical improvement efforts and how they might be further uh, developed to be ever more useful for, for that purpose. Um, and I'm going to share some of those um, uh, insights as, as I speak here. Um, uh, I also want to just um, um, acknowledge um, the, University, the Jönköping Academy for Improvement of Health and Welfare. I, I work there part-time as um, uh, a lecturer, uh, teach a lot, um, do my research. Uh, the other part of my time now I work uh, for the um, local office for health technology assessment in the Stockholm County Council. And I learned this morning that there is uh, similar work going on here, uh, which is very um, inspiring to, to hear. Um, to, uh, to put the, the work of Swedish quality registries um, in context, I'd like to, to, uh, to start by bringing it to life uh, and show a, a video from one of the registries, the rheumatology registry, uh, that can help us see what this means. As a full-time working mom, the disease is present in my daily life, both at home and at work. I love practicing yoga every day and have an active outdoor life with walks in the forest with my dog and skiing in the winter time with my family. It's important to me that I'm able to live my life the way I want and with as few limitations as possible. Different kind of treatments have an effect on my well-being, both the medical treatment and the benefits of exercise. The patient self-registration module works as a tool for me and it gives me the knowledge I need about my condition to improve my self-care and daily activities. I work together with my rheumatologist using the patient's self-registration. I can easily access the module via secure national web portal through my tablet. I report information about my symptoms, health and quality of life and the results are graphically displayed on the disease course and the responsiveness to my treatment. I see a great advantage that I'm able to measure my results and track my disease and I can monitor how it changed over time. With the patient's self-registration, I'm more prepared for my clinical visit and it improves my discussions with my rheumatologist. I can also check my health status in between visits and it's easy. I just enter on my device how I feel. The clinical module displays the patient's self-reported data, but also allows for me as a doctor to put in clinical information, such as number of swollen and tender joints and global scoring of disease activity, for example. I can also see data on prescribed medication and other outcome variables, and all this information is shown on the screen. For me, this is a valuable tool in the disease evaluation and in the decision-making process together with the patient. When I meet Sophie at the clinic, I already have access to information on how she is doing and how her current medication is working. So instead we can focus on important aspects of her rheumatic disease in order to further improve her health and her quality of life. I think 
working with the register has actually improved the quality of my patient meetings by giving them more structure. The register uses validated and reliable patient reported outcome measures that are nationally agreed upon. I can also compare the results from my patients with other clinics in Sweden which is an important quality aspect. All the information that is collected in the register by the patients and by the providers is what makes it possible for us to do really good clinical research. The web support system enables me to contribute to the management of my own health. My data enables research to improve healthcare in rheumatic diseases for patients of tomorrow. So, um, uh, for a little bit more uh, uh, of context, uh, here is uh, a map of uh, Scandinavia and superimposed you see the map of Ireland. So um, uh, apparently uh, Ireland is, or Sweden is about six times larger than Ireland by surface. I think the population is about double uh, because there are about 10 million people in Sweden. Um, historically there's been a strong emphasis on egalitarianism in Swedish society. Um, the country is uh, organized in three levels of government, the national, the counties and the municipalities. Most of the healthcare is the responsibility of the uh, counties. Um, um, increasingly, they're now renamed as, as regions, but it's that middle level. And they levy the taxes. They are responsible for making sure that all residents in the ge geographic area uh, have access to good quality healthcare. They can either provide the care by, uh, by their own organizations or they can uh, contract with uh, independent um, healthcare providers. And in, particularly, uh, in particular, in uh, primary care, there is a fair amount of, uh, of uh, private entities also providing care. Um, and some, uh, some um, uh, typical um, um, features of Swedish society, uh, you will see here. You might recognize some of these. Things that Sweden brought to the world. Not that we're proud or anything. Um, so, um, uh, on, the, on the point about um, egalitarianism, here is um, uh, the, the law that states the purpose. The goal for the healthcare system is good health and care on equal terms for the entire population, given with respect for the equal worth and dignity of the... Of, whoops. Something is missing here. Um, that's very curious. And dignity of each individual, I think it should say. The person with the greatest need for health care uh, should be given priority. I think the text has, um, has uh, jumped here on my slide. I have it here. Um, care should be given with respect for the equal worth and dignity of all individuals. The person with the greatest need for health care should be given priority. Um, uh, the, the Swedish national quality registries are governed by a, uh, a board uh, with members from uh, the national government and the uh, county level. And they, uh, five years ago when they launched a big um, uh, investment in registries, uh, they also um, articulated this vision statement. National quality registries are used in an integrated and active way for continuous learning, improvement, research and management to create the best possible health and care together with the individual. Um, so you can see there are multiple purposes, uh, uh, learning, research, improvement and also the uh, relationship, the involvement of patients is, is uh, highlighted here. Um, and how do then the registries uh, work? Here's what they typically record. Um, uh, patient demographics, provider organization characteristics, is it the hospital, health center and so forth, the structure of care, equipment, uh, those kinds of things, um, the process of care, what we actually do for patients or with patients, um, including patient reported experience measures, and the outcomes of care including, again, patient-reported outcome measures such as quality, health-related quality of life and so on. And I want to also um, 
highlight this book, uh, National Quality Registry. So I have a few copies with me, um, and if um, they all disappear today before I leave, um, more can be ordered online, and there's the link, uh, so you can access them. And this book um, uh, was recently translated from Swedish. It, it uh, conveys the experience of uh, Swedish quality registries, how they're operated, some of the legal foundations for using this in the health uh, service, and so forth. Um, these elements of, of, of quality data that are captured, uh, historically, this was done with paper, essentially, because this happened, it started before the emergence of information technology in, in healthcare, largely. Um, increasingly, it's being captured automatically, electronically, but there's still a fair amount of work to, to capture data or to enter data in the registries from the medical record. It, it doesn't always function automatically for a number of reasons. One is that the data isn't in a compatible format in the, re in the medical record. So it can't, even if you can connect the wires, so to speak, um, the format of the information is, is such that it doesn't uh, uh, travel correctly. Um, and so it requires a fair amount of, whoops, a fair amount of, um, of um, manual uh, uh, labor still, which is a, a challenge and something that perhaps uh, if you are starting uh, now, you can make sure to avoid because uh, that labor is uh, hard and uh, uh, better if avoided. Um, so this year there are 96 national quality registries in Sweden, 12 so-called candidates. Uh, they are um, registers in the making. They are early in their journey. They're not fully functional yet, but they receive national support because they have promised to, to develop into something functioning. They're all initiated and led by healthcare professionals. So this is an important point that uh, each registry is really run by uh, health professionals, many with, uh, with uh, research interests as well, uh, because this has a lot to do with uh, the acceptability of the registry among health professionals, that it's peers who, who manage these registries. They cover many areas of healthcare, from common to rare conditions, from nursing and primary to tertiary care. And some examples here, um, uh, stroke, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, most forms of cancer, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, end of life care, neurology with MS, Parkinson's, dementia care, HIV AIDS, that registry has essentially uh, complete coverage of the entire population in Sweden with HIV, and they've been able to document uh, fantastic uh, improvements in health uh, for patients due to uh, proper treatment. Diabetes mellitus, orthopedics, uh, pediatric care, renal failure, etc. So when you get to read the reports from all these different registries, um, I must say it's a humbling experience. You see the breadth of human suffering and of the talent and effort of health professionals in trying to relieve that suffering. It's quite impressive. Uh, so the financing uh, is provided by the Ministry of Health and Welfare, 70%, uh, and the uh, regions uh, uh, contribute uh, the remaining 30%. Um, this is done currently through a five-year agreement between the two parties, uh, and uh, there is ongoing discussion about how to go forward from, from here. Uh, funding is prov provided to each registry according to specified criteria, and there is a sort of an application process on a yearly or um, uh, two yearly uh, basis. Uh, different registries can get uh, anywhere from around 60,000 euros to about 700,000 euros annually. And uh, this is, um, uh, depends on, on the scope of the registry, obviously. Uh, for each registry, there is a multi-professional group uh, of national experts and often also patients serve on the board, governing board of registries, both as a measure for sort of uh, accountability, public insight, it's public money and so forth, but obviously they also bring important uh, knowledge and experience about the condition and the treatment. Um, and you could say that the, the more mature a registry, uh, the greater the expectations on it and the potential funding. So more and more functions are asked of them as they mature. These are our new uh, uh, bills with um, recent um, uh, famous prominent Swedes. I think they're quite attractive. We don't have the euro yet, so our own currency. 
Before I give uh, a few cases, uh, examples of registries and how they've been used for improvement purposes, I thought it might be helpful to frame this uh, with a model for quality improvement. Uh, uh, this one is proposed by uh, Batalden and Davidoff, and Paul Batalden uh, is uh, one of the pioneers of uh, quality improvement in healthcare um, and also a mentor for me. He has uh, been on the faculty at the Young Shipping Academy since we started, uh, which has been a great um, uh, a benefit for us uh, and pleasure. So they suggest that quality improvement is the combined and unceasing efforts of everyone, healthcare professionals, patients and their families, researchers, payers, planners and educators, to make the changes that will lead to better patient outcomes, better health, better system performance, better care, and better professional development. And I think that there are a couple of things of this in this model that are very important. Uh, one is this point about everyone. That there are so many different perspectives that are highly relevant to understand health and care and to improve it. And I think most notably that patients and, and their uh, families are included in this um, definition is, is very essential. Um, living with a condition, living with the treatment for that condition is uh, something that is hard to imagine if you don't have that personal experience. And so they contain and they bring um, important perspectives through that experience. Another feature I think is, is, is very important here is um, the box up on the top right, better professional development, uh, learning and joy in work. I think this is a sometimes overlooked feature of, um, uh, of work and of quality improvement that in order to really be sustainable if we make changes to the system uh, and if we try to, to make improvements, that part needs to be integrated into it. Otherwise, people will just not be able to sustain that type of work. Uh, it needs to be satisfying, fun even, to work, uh, to be able to carry on. So it's, it's an integral part to the model, not some sort of extra bonus. And I think um, also it signals that quality improvement um, works best, I think, when it's done um, by the people who actually provide the service in a, in a, in a spirit of um, uh, everything can be improved. Um, it's not that we're uh, correcting errors. Uh, we sometimes have to do that too, obviously, but really it's about continuous learning and improvement, uh, which is an important driver. Uh, and a source of intrinsic motivation. Uh, so, when I started to think about how registries can contribute to better health and better care, I realized that there are at least three different ways that that can happen. The first one I call clinical epidemiology. That's when the national registries yield new knowledge regarding healthcare methods and health outcomes, which can guide changes in clinical practice. And a classical example is from the orthopedic registries for um, uh, joint replacement, uh, hip replacement, for instance, here. Uh, what the Swedish registries have done is they have tracked every patient that received one of these prostheses and procedures and then looked at the outcomes over time. And they were able to begin to detect patterns that some of the techniques, some of the prostheses worked better than others. Some had more complications, loosening of the prosthesis and so forth. And so then they fed that data back to the clinicians across the country. And that has led to Sweden using really only six different types of prosthesis for hips. And I know that many other countries use maybe 50 different uh, models, some of which aren't as good. And this in turn has led to Sweden having the best recorded outcomes for this type of surgery uh, in the world. So it makes a difference, and it just seems like a good idea to learn from experience. Nobody could know beforehand, but over time you accumulate this knowledge, and then if you feed it back and sort of uh, follow it, uh, it can really make a difference for patients. Another way that registries can contribute to better health and care is by uh, publicly reporting providers' adherence to guidelines and the patient's outcomes. This enables providers to compare themselves with each other, to find guidance on how to increase their adherence and thereby how to improve, and then to evaluate the impact of their improvement efforts. Patients and other stakeholders can also compare providers and take action accordingly. And I would like to again emphasize the, the, the spirit of learning here. 
um, in the sweet, sweetheart registry for myocardial infarction, they have been able to demonstrate uh, many things. Uh, they've demonstrated the association between adherence to evidence-based guidelines and better patient outcomes. So it, they can demonstrate that the guidelines really make a difference if you follow them. Uh, they've also been able to demonstrate a decline in mortality as adherence across the country has improved and also as new technologies have, have become available in, in healthcare, new knowledge. But so in, in only 11-year uh, time here, one-year mortality for a heart attack dropped from 21% to 13.3%. Um, and uh, that's quite a remarkable improvement, I think. Um, another interesting experience from this registry was that they were feeding back data at the center level. Uh, each department received their own data in feedback reports, but this was done... Um, uh, uh, so that it was anonymous, only the center knew their own data and then they could see the rest of the country uh, anonymously, so to speak. Then they had discussions within the profession and said, we should start to report this publicly. There was resistance, there was unease. Um, they knew that there were some centers that were performing worse than others, uh, that weren't doing very well, didn't have very good, have very good adherence to guidelines. And they received, those centers also received the data and not much changed. Then they ultimately took this step. They did start to report it publicly so that anybody who was interested could see which department had which performance. And very quickly things improved, especially in those centers that had worst, the worst performance. And some of the clinicians who worked there have, have spoken, I've heard them at conferences, and they were very, very honest and said, it just became very uncomfortable to, to be there and uh, have everybody know that we weren't doing very well. We had to improve. I know this can be a, a controversial issue, but I think uh, for many reasons this is uh, the way to go. Uh, obviously, it requires uh, reliable uh, and valid data. So one of the things that sometimes happen when you start to publish data is that some people protest and say the data are wrong, and they may be right. And that's a gift that you should <laughs> embrace and thank them for and work with them to improve the data so that we actually do get reliable data. So that's not really, I think, an excuse for, uh, for publishing the data, but it's, it's a way to speed up the improvement of the data because they start to matter to everybody. So a third way that registries can improve health and, and care is something we already saw in that video. It's when clinicians and patients use, use data from the registry to uh, guide the design of care plans for individual patients. Uh, so in the rheumatology registry, for instance, the patient can re record their own um, health status uh, with a tablet and um, then that feeds into um, the registry and uh, can be reviewed together. And what's neat is that for this individual patient, you can see uh, how long they've had a disease, the level of activity of the disease, uh, combined with um, laboratory testing results and so forth. And then you can compare this patient's situation to other similar patients who've had the condition for about the same time and have had similar treatment. And you can plan from there and look at what happened to other patients when they made different choices of, uh, of therapy. So it's a very, very powerful decision aid based on data from the registry and data from the real world, so to speak, not just from clinical trials, but from, from the experience of, of uh, fellow patients. So um, the three different ways that I can see that registries can contribute to better health and better care, again, clinical epidemiology, public reporting of adherence and outcomes, uh, using registry data to guide the care for individual patients. Uh, here's a case from pediatric diabetes. Um, on the left here, you can see all the departments in Sweden where children with diabetes receive uh, care, uh, listed with a name. And you can see uh, the bars represent the average HbA1c uh, measure for uh, diabetic control in the entire population at each center. Obviously, there can be differences between centers in their patient mix and so forth, but not very large differences, we don't think, because um, uh, patients typically go to the center nearest them. Um, and you can see there is uh, quite a range. This uh, particular graph has data from two years. The gray bars are the previous year, and the yellow bars is the current year from the report. And the red bar there is the national average. 
So they're at just, uh, they're at around 57, 58 um, millimoles per mole uh, in this slide. The slide on the right-hand side uh, shows another way of uh, presenting the same data where uh, patients are uh, divided according to their age. And for each uh, uh, year of age, um, the data are presented here for three consecutive years. And again, national average for, for each um, cohort. So we can see that in young uh, children, the HbA1c levels are relatively low, and then they start to increase as um, they uh, approach puberty and teenage years. Is this something, do we have any pediatricians or, or people who work in pediatric care? Is this a pattern you know from uh, Irish pediatric uh, diabetes as well? Anybody? I suspect that this is a common pattern, uh, that things change when you enter puberty, but I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, so this registry uh, uh, decided to participate in an improvement effort in a collaborative, a breakthrough series collaborative, uh, which is a model developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, Paul Batalden and others. Um, and it consists of um, three or four meetings with uh, teams from around the country and experts in the topic. And then in between each meeting, each gathering, uh, the teams go back home and uh, test the different changes that they can make to improve their performance. And in this case, they receive data, they review the data from their own, uh, uh, own uh, department uh, to learn and find the areas for improvement. And in this case, on the right-hand side, there were also two follow-up gatherings over the uh, following year after the collaborative. Um, and uh, uh, over time, there were three rounds of these breakthrough collaboratives, and that ultimately meant that all the departments uh, that you saw in this registry participated in one of the collaboratives, and that in turn correlates with a substantial improvement on average HbA1c levels. So on the left is the situation for the country before these collaboratives. The average uh, at a national level was um, 64 millimoles per mole. Um, you may wonder the different colors of the bars here. So it it, it uh, signifies which of the three collaboratives each department participated in. And the national average is the green. Uh, on the right-hand side is the, the situation after the three breakthrough collaboratives were concluded, uh, and so it's gone down substantially. For a national average, I think this is a pretty substantial difference. And uh, the fun thing, I think, is that all departments improved uh, during uh, the, the course of this, of this um, project. It's quite impressive. This is uh, from the work of Annette Peterson, a nurse uh, who uh, I had the pleasure of um, advising for her PhD. So here's another case from cardiac care and myocardial infarction. Um, uh, I was uh, working with um, a program, a leadership development program on value-based healthcare, and uh, one of the participants uh, uh, was a cardiologist from southeast Sweden, the Kalmar County Council. And uh, we looked uh, with him at their data on, uh, on care from Sweetheart Registry. And then we tried to make the data more useful to them. And here, Mark Splain, who is a colleague from the US, helped us uh, with the uh, control chart uh, methodology, statistical process control, SPC. So Swedeheart, uh, I think is a very cute name. It's an acronym for the Swedish Web System for Enhancement and Development of Evidence-Based Care in Heart Disease Evaluated According to Recommended Therapies. That's quite an achievement, I think, <laughs> come up with that acronym. But there it is. Uh, it's been around for a long time. They've done tremendous uh, uh, progress. They've, they've uh, really improved uh, healthcare and uh, say helped save many lives in Sweden. Um, so from the registry, you can present data, for instance, uh, with geographic distribution like this. Uh, this is the 30-day mortality for patients with a heart attack and by county. And you can see that there is a range of mortality. Uh, the darker the color, the higher the mortality, from 2.6 to 3 percent, 30-day mortality in the lowest level, up to 4.7 to 5.7 percent in the darkest blue. So something is going on with the ge geographic connection there. can lead to questions and new ty types of inquiry. 
another way to use the data is uh, here to um, uh, look at um, uh, mortality rates according to number of patients treated per year. So on the x-axis is the number of cases per hospital, and on the y-axis is the uh, mortality. And this is a funnel plot, uh, so there are confidence intervals to try to distinguish if it's uh, as expected as predicted or if it is outside of what would be expected for that particular center. Uh, and you can see, and the top level is unadjusted um, according to um, uh, patient severity, case mix, and the bottom level it is adjusted. And it suggests that most hospitals do perform within the uh, expected range of performance, actually, when you adjust. But there are a few where you can uh, ask questions. Uh, for instance, there is a dot down there just under the, the lower limit, uh, which seems to be performing unusually well. So that's interesting. We'd like to learn from them and figure out what they're doing right. Uh, so back to our project. Uh, Value-based healthcare. We asked uh, um, uh, Dr. Landegren fr from the team, uh, "How does your service perform, and how do your patients fare?" And then he pointed us to something uh, called the Sweetheart Quality Index. So the index includes 11 evidence-based actions known to influence patient outcomes, where there is significant variation across the country. And each center is assessed for performance on these 11 actions and then graded a half a point or a full point, depending on how well they do, and there are targets that you're uh, supposed to reach, and where, again, there is a, there is, it's a sort of a, a goal most centers haven't yet achieved, so there is room for improvement. And it's uh, things such as the time to reperfusion uh, in a heart attack uh, with uh, PCI when you go in with a catheter and open up the blood vessels of the heart. We know that time is critical, so they measure the time, for instance. There's also some long-term follow-up, such as uh, smoking cessation uh, over the uh, following year, and things like that. So here are data from three consecutive years, um, where all, with all the hospitals rank ordered according to their uh, performance on this index with the 11 items. The yellow bars are the two hospitals from uh, Dr. Landegren's county. And so in 2012, they were near the center. 2013, his particular hospital actually was at the top. I think that's why he pointed us to this one. He was very pleased, and he should be. They did very well. Uh, the next year, they remained at the very top. Uh, but we asked him, so you're doing very well, but you could still improve. You're not even uh, uh, doing these evidence-based treatments consistently for all the patients. Where could you improve? Tell us, can we work with you? Then he said, well, I'll go and retrieve our data from the database, from the registry. So he downloaded all the data. Um, this is the Excel spreadsheet that he then produced. Each row is one individual or one episode of care. Each column is an indicator in the registry. There are about 300 quality indicators in this re registry for myocardial infarction. Uh, several hundred patients. And he asked, he came back and said, how do I find and convey the important information in this ocean of data? As a clinician, it's not an easy task. He doesn't have the time nor the skill necessarily to manipulate the data to, to draw out that important information. So we worked with him and produced this. This is a control chart, uh, data from one of the two centers. This is the center where the PCI lab laboratory is located. Uh, and each dot here is an individual patient. They're ordered uh, by time of admission. And uh, the red uh, line here is the target from the registry, from the index. It's 90 minutes. And this is the time from ECG diagnosis of a heart attack until you get the procedure and open up the blood vessels. Again, time is critical because it saves heart muscle and therefore affects prognosis very much. Um, we can see here that... Um, Actually, the majority of patients did receive the procedure here within the recommended time. 61 out of 75 per, uh, patients in that year, 81%, received the procedure on time. We can see that the average, which is the thicker uh, black line, a little bit below the red line, uh, that's the average for all these patients. It's at um, um, uh, 70 minutes. 
But obviously there are several patients who do not get this procedure on time. What we later discovered was some of these patients were patients who had come to the hospital uh, and not um, received a cardiogram before they came to the hospital, i.e. in the ambulance. They maybe had been driven in by, by a family member or come in by themselves. And sometimes they got stuck in the emergency department until somebody realized, oops, this is a heart attack. This patient should go to the PCI lab. So even though they were very close, it didn't necessarily help. In the other hospital where Dr. Landgren himself worked, um, a smaller hospital about uh, 90 minutes drive away from uh, the center, or 60 minutes drive maybe in an ambulance, the performance was different. There, was, uh, not, uh, there were fewer patients, first of all, it was a smaller place, but also a much smaller proportion of patients received the procedure on time. So there is a, a, an area in, in need of improvement. Um, uh, you can see that the average here is 126 minutes instead of 70 at the other center. Uh, obviously, ge geography plays in here. You can't change geography, but you have to think about how do you organize your system so that care is provided on equal terms for the entire population. It's not a trivial task. Another thing that was very interesting is when we started to look at um, performance in the um, pre-hospital care and the diagnosis of this procedure, because if you can diagnose the heart attack in the ambulance, you don't have to go to the one center, Vestavik, where they don't have the PCI lab. You can go straight to the PCI lab and save a lot of precious time. And then uh, Dr. Lundgren said, yeah, we do that. And then we looked at the data, and here's a way of um, displaying how they were performing on pre-hospital uh, ECGs. And in 2012, they did it consistently on every patient, but then something changed. They lost the performance, and so they started to miss every few patients. Uh, they failed to do the ECG in the ambulance, and he had never known about this. This was a complete revelation for him, news to him. And he said, I have to go back to my colleagues in the ambulance service and, and find out what happened. Why did they stop doing this consistently? Did something change in their guidelines? Uh, so uh, the data can really uh, reveal previously unrecognized truths about the care that can be very important for clinical management. So um, to, to, to try and sort of overview here, the registries can provide data in many different ways uh, that are helpful for many different purposes. And one question that I've been asking is how can clinicians and managers go from that uh, situation and, and the spreadsheet to this situation that can be more informative of local improvement efforts? And I think the answer is you need to have that type of skill and competency to um, analyze the data and present data in a way that really can speak uh, to clinicians and managers locally at the front lines. And that can enable improvement efforts uh, that are intelligent based on, um, based on, the, on the data. So some of my reflections as I've been uh, studying this and working with this, uh, national quality registries can be used to guide and evaluate local clinical improvement efforts. Definitely. I think they are a very, very powerful, helpful tool. So I recommend them highly. Uh, but access to data on its own doesn't automatically lead to healthcare improvement. Just because you provide the data doesn't mean that anything improves. It takes local uh, action uh, improvement uh, to make things better. Data can help, but they don't make it happen automatically. Uh, in our registries, uh, the data are often limited. For instance, in some registries, data are only collected once a year, heart failure perhaps, and therefore they may need to be complemented by a more temporary uh, local measurement if you're doing an improvement project to give a better, a fuller picture. Another challenge sometimes, it goes back to the way that data are recorded manually, is that sometimes um, data aren't current. Uh, sometimes it takes time before data entered into the registry are actually fed back uh, for local use. Sometimes they need to be um, analyzed, sometimes they need to be validated and so forth. But the, m the longer it takes between when the something happens and when you get the feedback on the data, the worse, basically. You lose a lot of currency of the data when they get old. So for improvement purposes, you'd like to have them so, n so close to real time as you can. Uh, and it can be a good thing. So uh, one thing that I've been uh, puzzling over also is, what is a quality registry, really? Is it a database? Or is it a, a network or a community of practice with dedicated and knowledgeable stakeholders? I think that's what it really is. 
And I think eventually, perhaps soon if we're lucky, information systems have matured and reached sufficient functionality. And then it will really be the networks of these dedicated and knowledgeable stakeholders that are needed to measure, analyze, and improve healthcare quality. That's what the registry will become, not the database. It's just a sort of an infrastructural support. It's the people coming together, being intelligent, uh, dedicated, uh, making changes that makes a difference. That's where the magic sits. And as I've been uh, following and supporting the Swedish registries, one thing I've come to realize is this simple uh, truth that uh, the perceived benefit of quality measurement, uh, for instance, in quality registries, has to outweigh the perceived burden. And unfortunately, that's not always the case today. There are many sources of burden in Sweden. Uh, it's, again, having to extract data from the health record, duplicate data entry, paper questionnaires that you have to then you know, collect and enter data from, multiple logins in different clinical IT systems at the front line. There are delays in data feedback. Data are inaccessible or hard to interpret. So there are quite a few challenges and sources of burden. But there are important benefits too. The biggest one, of course, is that we can uh, contribute to better health and better care. We can also support learning and improvement. It's, a, it's an opportunity for professional development. I can't think of few better things if you want to become a better uh, clinician or professional than to work with this kind of thing. And it allows an ability to compare performance across centers. And the registries and the people who work there have worked hard to develop valid measures, uh, which I think is also a, a real treasure uh, because it's not trivial to measure health in a good way. And so if you want to achieve this type of relationship where the perceived benefit really is greater than the perceived burden, I think you will do well to both try and reduce the burden, for instance, automation, a better connection between the medical record and the registries and so forth, which requires actually in the records collecting data in a format that already can be easily transferred to registry. Um, and today, at least in Sweden, we're thinking about uh, you know, getting the next generation of, of, of medical records, and I think this is a perfect opportunity to, to design this in a smart way from the beginning. And the other thing that obviously you would want to do is to enhance, increase, strengthen the benefit of the registries, make them ever more useful. Again, the data per se don't change anything, it's how you use them and make them useful that really makes a difference. So if this can serve as any encouragement or inspiration for you, I am delighted. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thor, for a really excellent presentation and uh, inspirational in terms of where we need to go and, and how indeed we can go there. Just before I throw this open to questions, uh, just to let you know, we will be having a coffee break before the next session starts at 11.15. For those of you who are wondering, whether you'll get your coffee fixed this morning, uh, and I'm one, one of them. And also, uh, if for those of you who don't get a chance to ask uh, Dr. Thor a question or maybe a little bit shy, he has kindly agreed to be available during the coffee break for people who may approach him and want to ask questions. So, <laughs> so what I'd like people to do is to put their hand up. We'll get a roving microphone to you. And then if you can um, maybe introduce yourself uh, as to who you are. Uh, anybody with a question? Maybe I'll just start off by asking, is there now a situation in Sweden where patients in the public are asking, why isn't there a register when they have a particular condition that may not be yet included? So is there a pressure from patients in the public to roll this across almost every aspect of patient care? Um, not, not on a broad scale, I would say, but there are, I would say that there are uh, uh, white spots on the map there are certain areas where we don't have registries, which I think is very unfortunate. For instance, for depression care or anxiety care, which are very, very common clinical conditions, and I think that there is some variation in how they are treated, uh, at least in primary care. I think uh, that's an unfortunate uh, situation. Okay. Those groups of patients don't tend to be always on the barricades and demanding these kinds of things, but uh, I think that that's definitely one. And then I, I know a couple of years ago we had a, a request from uh, a group of clinicians who work with uh, the fibrosis of the lung, 
where I understand there has recently uh, uh, emerged new medication with a new possibility to treat this condition that didn't exist before. So they were very eager to, to launch a new registry, but at that time it was determined that there wasn't enough funding to, to invest in new registries as much, so they, they had to wait. Um, okay. Again, a small patient group. I don't know to what extent they are sort of organized to be advocates uh, for these things. Um, but I, on the other hand, there are some, some ad patient advocacy groups uh, for, for some of the established re registries, such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis, have a very sure. good uh, patient, uh, patient uh, group, uh, diabetes uh, likewise, and the Heart Lung Foundation in Sweden and so forth. So there are many groups uh, that are active on this field. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions from the floor? Fidelma. Thank you very much for your presentation, Fidelma Fitzpatrick. I'm a microbiologist in a hospital here in Dublin. How do you get your data into the register in the first place? Because I was sitting here trying to think of, if I'm in Beaumont, how would you even attempt to get data out of paper-based charts? So do you have an electronic health record, or do you have an army of people that are going through charts and inputting it into the first database before you extract it and send it in nationally? Uh, all of the above uh, is the answer. Sometimes, it, when you're lucky, it can go from the, from the medical record, which is electronic, and then you more or less just uh, hit the button. Or really, uh, the way the law is, is uh, framed around this is that um, it's an opt-out situation for patients. So it's voluntary for patients to participate in the registries. Obviously, the medical record is not voluntary. Uh, so so uh, patients have a right to opt out from having their data entered into the registry. Um, uh, but it's not, it, we don't have a consent uh, requirement that you have to sign any consent form, but, but you have the right to opt out. Um, so once uh, data are in the, record, in the medical record, they, they can be entered into the registry. Again, sometimes we're lucky and it can really happen automatically. Overnight, the rheumatoid arthritis registry, for instance, have, have uh, created um, uh, connections, not just the wires, but the, the sort of the formatting of the data so that from the medical record, data can go straight into the registry very conveniently, saves a lot of time. Uh, I know many other registries are, are working on this, but it's not been as easy. And I think actually uh, Sweden here has suffered a little bit from this work having started at a time when we only had paper records. And so everything was designed initially from a, a situation where there were paper records and, and there was abstraction from the paper record and manual entry of data into these databases. Uh, today we don't have to, to, um, to do that. We can design the medical records, uh, electronic medical records, so that we already from the outset think about how can we aggregate data from the entire population of patients maybe in our country with this particular condition so that we report, say, smoking status in the same way so that, uh, you know, smoker means the same thing uh, everywhere. That if you get that right from the beginning, it will save enormous amounts of uh, time and labor down the road. So it's something I really highly recommend. Okay, another question here, I think. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I'm Connor DC. I, <clears throat> I work with the NOCA Major Trauma Audit. And one of the spaces that we want to get into is following up quality of life and functional outcomes. And we look to Victoria and we see a 95%, 98% capture rate using telephone follow-up. And I'm just wondering what the Swedish experience has been of letter-based versus telephone follow-up of their various registries. That's a really interesting question. And I think um, the short answer is that patients are different. Patient groups are different. Uh, so I think you have to sort of tailor it to, to the, the patient group, page, patient population that, that any particular registry works on. Um, I would say young people, most people are, are very, uh, you know, wired these days and use uh, all sorts of devices and can, can respond on their smartphone or whatever easily. Uh, whereas in other groups, that's much less uh, likely, at least in the near future. Um, in Sweden, there's also a national system for safe um, communication between uh, individuals and the healthcare system. So you can't really do this via email and so forth because it's insecure, uh, unsecure you know, uh, data management. But you can do it on this safe portal. So you can send out an invitation to somebody via email or some other uh, method. And then they can enter this portal and, uh, for instance, uh, respond to a quality of life survey that's available electronically there. And you can track and you can send reminders of that. So, so there are ways to, to do this and, and simplify. But I also understand that some people 
uh, quite passionately think that the paper uh, survey is still unparalleled in, in sort of response rate. So um, I don't think we have the complete answer. And it may be, again, because different populations are different. I think we have a question down there. Hi, Dr. Tor. Sorry, my name is David Galvin. I'm a urologist uh, specializing in prostate cancer, and I'm the uh, principal investigator of a, a project called IPCOR, which is the Irish Prostate Cancer Outcomes Registry, and it's very similar to the project with your video at the start around rheumatology. We've developed apps and portals that patients will put in all their functional questionnaires after their surgery and their radiotherapy, and they'll feed us back all their quality of life data. Um, the project is funded by the, the well-known charity Movember all across the world, and obviously it's a privately funded project. Uh, and the problem is, for me, that I face is that the funding is going to run out in about two years from this charity. And what I, and what I wanted to know from you and get a bit of advice about how do I build a business case and to the, the national organizations about how they can support a, a registry like this, because naturally it's a... It's a resource issue moving forward about uh, what are the financial gains and the, the benefits to, I suppose, our Department of Health and our health organizations about registries like this. Thank you. That's such an important question. And congratulations on your really important work. Uh, it's a sign of positive dev deviance, I think. You already have the know-how in your midst. So, so tap into it. Um, um, I would... I would uh, say that uh, the answer to, to how do you build a business case, uh, you already have. One, one is, uh, is uh, approaching uh, patient groups. In Sweden, the patient group for prostate cancer is quite vocal and strong and, and have been an important player in improving care for prostate cancer. So sometimes you're lucky and, and patient groups are around and can be vocal advocates. That helps. But that's not always true. Uh, some conditions don't really lend themselves to that so well. Uh, so it can be a bit unfair, you could say. And then professionals have to do the job, I think. Um, and also, I think uh, the business case, yes, you might have to just calculate how much would it cost to run a registry like that, how much better could health become because of that, how much better would healthcare become, uh, how many costs would we save, how many lives would we extend, and so forth. Uh, it's that type of calculation. I think actually it's a pretty strong case in most cases, um, uh, and it needs to be done. Um, I think actually it's, it's a really smart investment most of the time at the national level, for instance. And again, also, if we think about the, the goal of uh, equality and, and some sort of uh, equal uh, care and equal opportunity for good outcomes across the whole population, it becomes a national interest as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, Maura O'Connor, Public Health Medicine. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I'd be interested in the Swedish experience of the quality of registries in uh, the last few years here, there was a review of national patient registries using international quality criteria, and they did very poorly, it would be the answer. And it seemed to be the longer the registry was running, the more likely it was to run into trouble as interest and funding died down. And five or ten years on, they were the registries where we would have had particularly governance issues around what was happening. So it's really around when the focus and the interest sort of wanes a bit, it's the quality of those national registries because it's very challenging and it's interesting to set up a new registry, but it's actually the ongoing maintenance 20, 30 years down the road and you're dealing with patients and patient confidentiality issues. Thank you. That's also such an important uh, question or, or aspect. And, and so many of the people who started registries in Sweden also are clinical researchers, and therefore many have been involved in, in uh, clinical trials and are quite familiar with uh, the need for data validity and validity uh, reviews of the data. So you have to quality check the data that go into registries and so forth. And so uh, most of the registries uh, do this on a regular basis. The, the youngest ones may not have gotten around to it initially, uh, but, but it's certainly uh, a, a, a common feature. There is a handbook uh, in Sweden for how to do val validity assessment of the registry data because obviously it's very important that the data are valid if you're going to make um, any meaningful comparisons and analysis of the data. Uh, and another thing I think is, is an interesting uh, point about sort of waning interest over time. My experience is that uh, when the registry uh, speaks to something that people care about, it will uh, promote interest and it will be sort of self-perpetuating. It can be very um, 
inspiring. Uh, often there are, are champions, you know, a few individuals who, who start this thing, but, but if, if they're able to uh, demonstrate through the, the feedback, the reports that they put out and so forth, uh, the benefit of the registry work, uh, the measurement, and how it makes a difference for patients, for clinicians, and again, remember that uh, triangle model with the uh, learning and joy in work also for clinicians. I think it's a, a really quite important issue for health systems, certainly in Sweden, um, you know, uh, low morale and so forth can be an issue, and I think this is one of the best ways to counter that, that problem, is to make it uh, meaningful and inspiring to work with improving the care that you provide on a daily basis. Okay, we have a question here. Um, thank you very much. My name is Lenore Leonard. I work as an Infection Prevention Control Manager in the Beacon Hospital. Uh, we collect a lot of data in infection prevention control. So, for example, uh, central line infections, or peripheral line infections, surgical site infections. The problem is um, analysing it. So there's a big problem with analysis. I'm just wondering, do you have data analysts to actually analyse your data for you? Because we all have our own jobs to do, and trying to you know, look at that information is extremely difficult. Yes, uh, uh, that's a good, good question. Um, uh, I would say, yes, we have some analysts, but not enough. I think it, more would be helpful. And like I showed on the cardiac uh, registry example here, uh, the registry wasn't able to provide those types of reports that we found to be very, very useful at a local level. It, it required uh, other types of competency, especially the statistical process control methodology, which I think is very underutilized in, in healthcare still. Uh, I wrote a systematic review on that topic um, for my PhD years back, uh, and I, I saw, I dem we demonstrated through the review the enormous potential that this has to really inform uh, improvement and management of healthcare. I think it's an untapped uh, opportunity uh, that would be worthwhile. Um, uh, and I think, yes, more an an analysis is helpful. But I also would like to caution, especially if we are relying on more manual types of data collection and entry, to not overburden ourselves with uh, data collection. Um, I think Einstein is uh, quoted as having said, uh, make, si make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I would say, collect as much data as you need, but not more, uh, to, to try and parallel that. Um, and really, uh, start perhaps with how do you hope to use the data before you start to collect the data, so that you really know what you need to achieve the impact that you hope to achieve, and then you go out and start to collect the data. You can always tweak it over time, but I think it's, it's really important to start with that end, um, end goal, so to speak, uh, and also to weave in that analytical capacity, because it's, it's what makes it worthwhile or not. If you can't analyze it, then the data are more or less meaningless. You know? it's, it's only when we get them out there that they make a difference. So just just to repeat that, just in case people at the back may not have heard it, this is about you know relating local data to national data and getting buy-in. I think is that a fair fair summary? Okay. I think we've. Uh, I think the point about the, the orthopedics uh, narrowing it down to six prosthesis. What's so interesting is that it was the orthopedic orthopedic surgeons themselves who yeah. did this. Nobody came and told them. They figured this out themselves. And it was uh, partly sort of uh, professional pride, I think, and, and commitment. And again, they saw that this was the rational thing to do. Uh, and 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 if you use very many different kinds, it's more because of the preference of the individual orthopedic surgeon. But I think the key question to ask is. What performance do you see from, uh, what, you know, what outcomes do you see for your patients? Is it as good as it could possibly be? Okay, we have a question here. Um, thank you very much. I'm Jamie Saris, a medical anthropologist from Maynooth University. Um, I like the presentation. I was struck by what you skimmed over, which seems to be like the most challenging aspect of change, and you stuck it under management, but that's a pale reflection of the human infrastructure that clearly is working and so I wonder if you have a couple of, you know, insights about why does it seem relatively easy to get patients and clinicians and nurses and NGOs and managers in the same room working on the same project? Because that struck me as the, uh, the primary strength of the Swedish system. Um, uh, sometimes I guess it's hard to, to see the water you're swimming in. Um, my wife is an anthropologist, so I can relate to this discipline. Um, 
Uh, maybe there is a little bit of a consensus culture in Sweden that has something to do with it, I don't know. Um, uh, but I think um, it started with champions, really clinical champions. Um, the first registry was for knee, um, uh, knee, um, hip, uh, knee joint replacements in 1975, I think. And it was an orthopedic surgeon who had been in the US and, and learned some things and came back and thought about this. We really don't know the outcomes for the procedures we do for the patients we care for. We need to know that. So they started registry. And uh, I guess it sort of started selling itself just like a very common sense good idea. Uh, and again, I think the, the best um, um, argument for this is demonstration that it works. If people see and feel that it works, then, then, you're, then you're home, I think. If they, on the other hand, see that it's a lot of work and no, no benefit, they're not going to continue. So that's, I think, the, the key thing. And then over time, things have evolved, such as patient involvement, which was not at all part of it from the beginning, but it's becoming more and more integral, uh, and I think reflects uh, uh, changes in society at large and, and culture at large, uh, you know, less of the um, uh, patriarchal uh, healthcare uh, approach and more of a... Uh, participatory so forth. Okay, we'll, we'll take maybe two more questions. We have one here. My name is Tr Teresa and I work in, in, in the Infection Prevention and Control Department in Bombard Hospital. Uh, I just would like to know what uh, national uh, quality registries do you have related to infection prevention and control? And also uh, what kind of perception uh, have you experienced from, from the from patient point of view? Thank you. Uh, such an important topic, I think. Um, there is no uh, registry specifically for infection control, but many of the different uh, condition-specific registries also look at that. For instance, I know there is an infection registry that looks at um, uh, six or seven different uh, conditions, sepsis, but also they look at joint um, uh, infections. Um, uh, so septic arthritis they look at. Uh, and. Um, 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 yeah, so, so again, the, 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 the way that you decide to sort of slice what you will measure and in which registry you will enter the data is not entirely uh, thought out. There's no master plan that, that everybody agreed upon. It's partly that it's just evolved in certain ways, and historically that's what happened. Um, so you could be more rational about it, I think. And sometimes uh, we, we get reports that registries notice that there's overlap, that two different registries actually collect data on the same patients for the same condition. That makes no sense. So then we ask them to figure it out and divide you know, the responsibilities. Um, then there are other types of measurements that aren't uh, formally quality registries. There are a few health data registries they're called that are run by the National Board of Health and Welfare, a government agency in Sweden. For instance, uh, the, the um, hospital registry where they record every hospital hospitalization in the country with the um, ICD diagnosis and so forth. Um, uh, so some, some ways you can get data from other sources as well to look at these things. But then sometimes, and I think infection control is such a case, uh, it's more of a local um, database uh, used for local management in particular facilities and so forth. Um, but there's no um, dedicated uh, infection control national registry. Yet, at least. Okay, thank you very much. I think probably what we'll do is we'll bring this part of the morning session to a close. I want to reiterate again my thanks to Dr. Thor for a really outstanding presentation and for inspiring us as to what we can do. And you can tell by the questions and the depth of the questions how, how much it uh, uh, resonated with people here in the hall. So thank you very much, Dr. Thor. Thank you.